Hello, I'm Brian Little. I've been a professor for about 40 years uh, and at various universities, uh, including Carleton in Ottawa, McGill University, Harvard for a few years, and Cambridge University in the UK. Uh, most recently, I'm now, I hope, finally retired, uh, but I find that I'm not really a very retiring person, at least in that sense. And so it's always nice to be able to engage with people who want to talk about education and professing. I'm in a field of research, it's called personality science, in which we explore the way in which you, you, the person listening right now, are like all other people, like some other people, and like no other person. And the way we look at how you're like some other people is perhaps the most popular and influential approach to human personality now. It's captured by the notion of um, the big five traits of personality. Um, they spell out an, an acronym, OCEAN. So O stands for openness to experience, C for conscientiousness, E for extroversion, A for agreeableness, and N for neuroticism. And each of these dimensions has been found to emerge in the language and in the uh, folk taxonomies of different cultures. Um, there are a few minor exceptions, but basically these dimensions, which are dimensions, they're not types, there are dimensions where you can be in the middle or you can be extended towards the extremes, which describe the way in which you approach the world. And just a couple of examples, and then I'm going to challenge whether that's a good way of looking at human personality. And then I will stop. So let me start with um, what the trait perspective can bring. First, um, let's take openness to experience and conscientiousness. Um, both of these have implications for the way in which we succeed or do not succeed in our academic lives, in our organizational progress, um, even in our health um, status. Um, those who are open to experience love to do things in a creative way. They enjoy the, the new, the different. They, they get a kick out of it. They are energized by, hmm, what's that? Curiosity is critical for those individuals. Conscientious individuals, on the other hand, are really the kind of person you want if you want a reliable person who is perhaps on the brink of being obsessive compulsive, but nonetheless gets things done on time effectively. And those who are highly conscientious live longer, they're healthier, in part because they have the kind of self-control that uh, uh, Walter Michel in this series talked about, the ability to, to stop doing things reflexively, like have another beer, and instead uh, do things that are going to advance their health. So already you can see that the way in which you are like other open people or other conscientious people has significant implications for the way your life is going to play out. Extroversion is probably the most studied. I've talked about it and lectured about it for many years. Um, extroverts need to have stimulation and particularly positive stimulation. They love other individuals. They seek them out. They feel dissipated if they don't have that social stimulation. Um, the lockdowns uh, generated by COVID are particularly stressful for those who are extroverted. Those who are introverted, and perhaps surprisingly to some of you, that would include me, are not, are not energized by engagement with other individuals, particularly. Um, instead, we enjoy things that are quieter. Susan Cain wrote a book called Quiet, in which she explored this in some detail. And there's a chapter in that book about this funny Canadian professor who happened to be teaching at Harvard at the time, who looks extraordinarily like me. And actually, I guess, was me. And in that chapter, she talks about how this professor 
uh, was seen by his students as an over the top extrovert. But in fact, he used to escape in order to go to the washroom after a lecture so as not to be disturbed by the gregarious extroverted students who wanted to talk to him for 18 hours. And this is typical. Many of us act out of character. Many people who might score as neurotic act as stabler, perhaps pseudo-stable when they're up for uh, an important uh, encounter. Um, they're presenting, they're taking an exam, and they don't let their neuroticism spill over into their performance. They suck it up. But after, they need to find what I call a restorative niche in which they can be themselves again. What is the alternative? I mean, the point that I make frequently with my students is, is, is that all we are? Are we just a bunch of traits? And I don't think we are. Instead, I think what we need to look at when we ask a person what their personality is, when we're trying to find out what really moves them is not what type they are or what traits they manifest. Rather, it is what are the projects in their lives that give them meaning, that create structure, that gives them a sense of efficacy, um, that, that can breed joy, and the approach that I've taken, based in part upon the same impulses that drove Kelly to his innovative work, is asking people to list what their ongoing projects are and to rate them on various dimensions. And it's those projects that allow us to dip beneath the surface. Uh, Dave, let's make up a name, for example, might be seen as going to parties all last summer in the block, he's going to every block party and he stays longer than anyone else with his wife. He's gregarious, apparently. He, he initiates gatherings. And you may be tempted to say, there's Dave, he's an extrovert. But what if Dave is actually very introverted, but he has a core project? What his neighbors may not know is his wife is received a diagnosis that she's dying. And she's an incredible extrovert. She lives for other people. And so what he does, his project is make these last few months as deeply meaningful for Marie as I can. And so he throws himself into these things. He may be good in enacting them so people don't know. But after he's finished those events, which are in the service of a core project without which his life would be meaningless now, he's exhausted and spent and needs to recover by spending time on his own. So it's these personal projects, these ground projects that, that uh, a philosopher Bernard Williams talks about that I think is what we really need to know when we have conversations with people about how they are. In one of my classes, I, I used to um, come in and there'd be five or six students milling about and um, they would, uh, I would say, hi, how are you doing? And they would say, fine. And the next day I come in, hey, how are you doing? Fine. Another, hey, how are you doing? Fine. And then one day, I don't know why, I just said, no, really, how are you doing? And that simple, no, really, how are you doing, stimulated a whole bunch of comments that got into what the life of that person was really like. Oh, not bad. My mom and dad are divorcing, and so I'm sort of trying to figure out how to handle that. And somebody else would say, well, I'm taking this statistics course that is sucking the very soul out of me. And somebody else would say, well, my boyfriend's just gone to Stanford and I don't know what to do. And in responding to no, really, they didn't say, oh, um, I'm an extrovert, so I'm happy. Or I'm conscientious, so I'm going to ace your course. They told me what was their top concern. What was the project that was um, 
shaping their life at that point. And so when I lecture now, uh, as I continue to do um, in different venues, I, I like to say that this is a no really lecture. I don't want to just tell you about traits of personality. I want to find out what's going on in your life that brings you meaning, brings you a sense of connection with others. And how might we help you advance that in ways that will redound to your better health and a better impact on your own environment? So it started um, the way I do the study of personality with the George Kelly notion of ask people what they're on about. They might just tell you and then sharpen it with analytic tools so that you cannot just um, explain their behavior, you can enhance it. 